This is the definitive guide to Kirimoto 2.5. For the uninitiated, Kirimoto is a maker tool, a slicer for 3D printing in FDM or SLA, a G-code and path generator for CNC milling, and an SVG, PDF, and G-code generator for laser cutters. Kiri comes from Kiri-e, the traditional Japanese art of paper cutting, and Moto comes from modeling tool. There's no software to install. Kirimoto runs directly off of Gridspace in your browser. It's entirely free and open source. It does not rely on the cloud. All processing happens in your browser. All data remains local to your browser. Unlike installed desktop software, it has no access to your local file system, so it's very secure. Also off Gridspace, access to forums and code, a wiki, as well as Facebook groups, YouTube videos like this, Twitter, a Discord, chat group, and email. Kirimoto also runs as an integrated cloud app inside of Onshape. As a tab inside of an Onshape application, it has direct access to your models. There's no need to export and import files to use them and to print and to generate CNC code paths. It also runs as a Thing app inside of Thingiverse. Same thing applies. If you find a model you like, open it directly in Kirimoto, start slicing and printing. For the hardcore, you can download the code, run it locally, and open it in your local browser against local host. Because this is a definitive guide, it is quite long. Find the time code for the section you're interested in, jump directly to it, or just follow along for a complete overview. When you open Kirimoto for the first time, you're presented with a help menu. It tells you a little bit about the project, how to get started, keyboard and mouse controls, as well as links to various forms of support, and a little bit about the project as well. You can dismiss this, and let's go over the layout for this page. In the top left, you've got the mode that you're currently working in, FDM, SLA, CNC, or laser. In the middle, Kirimoto with the version number. You can click that to get the help menu. On the type rate and the profile, you can select languages, which is pluggable if anyone wants to contribute new languages. Export allows you to export all your profiles and settings, the help menu itself, and then the ability to switch to older versions of Kirimoto. On the left-hand side, we have device control, machine setup, preferences, file import, the ability to change the view, and then the mode that you're working in for a given device, as well as control for the objects. Let's go into each of these individually. Let's look at device configuration. This allows you to select your device type and customize it. You'll notice that the selected type here matches what's in the top left-hand side. If we switch to CNC, we'll get a different list of devices, and then we can choose one. And if we wish to customize it, click the Customize button. that will place it down under My Devices. It allows you to rename it and edit all the fields. If you do not do that, then the fields are not editable. I'll get into what each of these settings does for a given device type in that section of the video. Then there are our preferences. You'll notice I switched to the cam mode, which gives me tools. Tools doesn't exist in the other modes. And preferences. Application preferences control the things that you see here, and I'll get into each of those later on. This menu does change based on the device type that you're using. Files allows you to look at recent files that you've had open and open them again with the size and the ability to rename them and the ability to import new files. You can also drag and drop files directly onto the platform in order to import them. View allows you to change your views if you're not using the keyboard shortcuts, clear the workspace, or perform an arrange if you have multiple devices. Start allows you to basically take the settings that are on the right-hand side and apply them to the part that you have in front of you. And then rendering allows you to change the way a part appears on the, in the workspace, and this is useful in other ways. Rotations allow you to perform basic rotations to a part on a given axis. By default, the arrow keys will rotate on a given axis by 5 degrees. You can also choose to rotate a given axis by an arbitrary amount by typing in a number and hitting Enter. And if you want to reset, it will undo any changes you've made to rotation. The way scale works is a little bit more interesting. The scale changes apply to whatever axis is checked and whichever uh, and relative to whatever field you hit enter in. So if I click on 2 here, the entire part on X, Y, and Z will be scaled relative 2 to 1. And so the entire part becomes twice as large. If, however, in the scale I uncheck 
y and z, and then change it back to 1, it's going to make only the x-axis half as large because the relation of 2 to 1 is 1 half and only the x-axis is checked. So this allows you to basically do relative and axis uh, restricted scaling. Um, you can also do the same thing with a given uh, amount saying I want to make the x-axis 30 uh, millimeters in this case and the same thing applies. So if I have x, y, and z checked and then I change it 30 to 15, it's going to change all the axis to half their scale resulting in a half size and you'll see the other fields uh, update appropriately. In almost all cases, the escape key undoes whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a dialogue, escape, a menu popped, escape, escape gets you out of anything, including help menus. The remainder of the interface is adaptive based on the mode that you're working in. For example, a nozzle shows up because we're in FDM mode and have a device that has multiple nozzles. The tool menu is not here because we're not in CNC mode. On the right hand side, this is the profile section, typically contains the settings for the process that you're working on. In this case, it's an FDM process. And in CNC mode, there's a menu at the bottom. The top of the screen contains a progress bar, and we'll get into each of those in the device specific settings. This is an overview of the FDM 3D printing mode in Kirimoto. I'm going to assume a passing familiarity with 3D printing and launch into how Kirimoto approaches this task. First thing you want to do is select the device type FDM, find the device that's closest to the one that you're looking for, either by scrolling through the list or by searching for it. And once you've got a device that you want or want to modify, you can just select it. If you want to modify it, these are fields are not editable unless you customize it. After that, you can edit any of the fields you want, add extruders, etc., and a customized device can be exported and shared and if you want to contribute a device then please do so. I'd be happy to accept that and fold it back into the main line. Um, once you have exported a device, if you go in here and delete it, you can drag it in like this and import it and that's how you share a device. Um, it's a very easy way of uh, creating new devices and sharing them around and contributing back to the community of code. Once you've got a device configured, um, I'm just going to show you the basic workflow and then go through each of the configuration options. Clicking on slice uh, performs the very basic uh, slicing operation to turn this into a series of layers. There's a slider on the bottom. Uh, which you can scroll up and down through to look at various layers. You can look at the single layer mode like this and then go back to all layers. Uh, this is useful for debugging. There are hotkeys for all of these things. You can use the mouse wheel and scroll to go up and down like this. And um, so the slice mode <clears throat> is only a preview of the slices. If you want to look at what uh, the speeds are going to be and the routing uh, with moves and such, then you go into the preview mode where colors uh, are equated with uh, the speed of the print and you can turn on and off various things like the move lines and arrows that show you the direction of move and if you want to go back and debug your prints this is a really good way of doing a sort of a layer by layer analysis of your print. So the first thing to um, go into with respect to this sort of debugging step is that there are a couple of different ways of visualizing your parts. Um, and if you go into preferences, there's this line type. The default is path. Let's go into flat and re-slice it. And flat slicing uh, doesn't give us a 3D path. It gives us 2D slices. And this is actually a somewhat better way of debugging the way paths might overlap each other. Um, it also is a little bit less intense on your graphics card. Um, and this is one of the traditional ways that Kirimoto would have uh, viewed a part. There is one um, even more efficient way of looking at um, a part in 3D, and that's line rendering. And uh, it is a little less easy to see parts in line rendering, but it does give you a very interesting view um, of the, the paths. So um, this is really good for debugging in preview mode. If you want to get right down into exact path routings with arrows and gauges and retracts, um, this is the way you would sort of debug a part from that perspective. So um, each of these modes has their place. Um, 
and this mode in particular is very good for underpowered graphic devices. Um, and it's worth sort of going into so that you know how to analyze a part um, if you're getting down to that level of analysis. So that is the, the basic overview here for slicing and preview. And then of course export is goes through the slice preview and then generates this. You can take a look at the G code that's going to be output, um, the file size and time estimates and things like that, and then download the code. If you have a local device you can send to, there is a preference for turning on things like Octoprint or other targets, and you can send directly to those if they're supported. It's beyond the scope of this video how to do that, um, but there is a guide online. Now we'll cover the right hand profile menu. Uh, first, an overview, and then individually. The layers menu controls the way individual layers are sliced. Base is the first layer controls for your print, which is, of course, the most important layer in a print. Infill controls the way hollow spaces are filled if they're not solid. Support allows you to add and control support structures for areas that overhang the print. Um, output controls the way um, routing is done between shells and infill, flow factor, and the order of things. The expert menu has more advanced settings for things like lifting the nozzle to move across the part to prevent drag, as well as things like the shortest polygon and how to slow down for areas like that. Profile allows you to save and load groups of these settings so that you can remember between different parts and different filament types. Now let's explore each of these menus in a little more detail, starting with the layer menu at top. This controls how slices are done at each level of the part. Uh, and here we have a slice level set of 0.15 millimeters, shell count of three. And let's just let's take a look at what that looks like when we slice it. Here you can see each of the different features highlighted in a different color. Let's uh, zoom in on the top of the part with the T key and use the V key to look at a slice at a time. Here we can see three outer shells and the infill here is in green. I'm sorry, the fill is in green, which is solid. The infill is the sparse fill. And if we zoom down through, this is the sparse fill layer here. So if we turn this back on as uh, with V again to look at the whole part, we can turn each of these things on and off individually to look at those features. Um, so here we go. Now let's see what the effect of changing these things is. If we go down and change the shell count to, for example, like one, and then re-slice this, you can see that there's only one outer print or shell here. That's a, a pretty obvious and notable change. Um, if we want to look at like solid layers, for example, the top and the bottom layers um, are the number of solid layers that are forced. So if we look at the top here, one, two, three solid layers before the sparse infill begins, and that's a pretty obvious setting. The less obvious one is the solid layer setting here. And what that controls is when you have flat areas like this or overhangs like this, what do you do with those spaces? And if we zoom down through this and take a look at this flat spot, for example, it's creating three projections for each of those flat spots, one, two, three, and then it's empty, and then we have a uh, overhang like this with one, two, three projected up. So what the solid areas does is it controls the uh, solid layers rather controls the projection of uh, synthesized solid areas. One other change um, here that is worth noting is adaptive and thin walls. And so let's look at adaptive uh, first. Right now we have a 0.15 layer height this is a fixed layer height. Uh, with the exception of the base layer, which is set at 0.2. If I change this to something like 0.3, for example, let's look at them. We have 165 layers now. We reslice that. Basically, half the number of layers, 82 layers, is what we're going to see. And you can see these nice, sort of beefy layers here. They're a lot thicker than what they would have been. Um, adaptive it gives you the ability to adapt between two different um, heights. So in this case, 0.3. If we turn on adaptive and say the minimum height is 0.1, oops. 0.1, and then re-slice it, we're going to get uh, variable layer heights. You can see some thin layers here, some thicker ones here. This is the most obvious notable change. And what adaptive does is attempt to make sure that you have a dimensionally accurate part. So these faces here in the Z all line up uh, exactly with the parts dimensions. And so um, this is somewhat notable in curved features. If you have curved areas in the Z, um, it'll, uh, it'll make those very nice and smooth. And for uh, 
engineered parts like this and make sure that the faces line up perfectly on the Z flats. That's what adaptive does. And then thin walls is better look, uh, seen with another part. So let's uh, remove this and pull a thin wall part here. All right, let's make sure that the uh, thin wall option is turned off and slice this and see what we get. We will notice that all of the shells are set to three. There are these areas that are not picked up by that offsetting. This turns out to be a mathematically difficult thing to do easily, which is why this is reserved as a separate setting. If you go in here and turn on thin walls and then slice it, you'll notice that these areas are in fact now filled in properly. And when we do a preview, we'll see that those areas now have filament in them. This is a separate option because it is both computationally expensive for large and complex parts and isn't, as a heuristic, isn't 100% perfect. So there are times when you want it on or off. And unless you're deal dealing with parts that have these problems, you probably want to have it turned off. Jumping back to our default part here, let's take a look at the base settings. Most of these settings don't affect what you'll see visually. They are output settings, uh, like for the first layer. What is the temperature of the bed and the nozzle? How fast you output sh shells, um, infill, and um, an extrusion multiplier for the first layer if you want to, for example, add a 10% flow rate increase for the first layer to make it stick better, you might do that. You can't see that until you actually print. There are a couple things that you can see. One is the layer height. So let's just make this something ridiculous, like half a millimeter, and then slice this thing. So what you will notice is that the first layer, the default layer is 0.15 and the base is at 0.5. And so you have this nice fat beefy layer on the bottom of the first layer. You can't really usually print a half milliliter with a 0.4 nozzle, but this is just to show you visually what we're going to see here. Um, the other settings that are um, going to give you a visible impact are a skirt count and a skirt offset. So let's just say a skirt count of two and an offset of two millimeters. And you won't see this in slice mode, but if you go into preview mode, you'll see the skirt out of the bottom, and that's this here. And this is good uh, as a way of pre-purging the nozzle and make sure that you don't you know, start off with a non-printing or stringing. And uh, one thing you can do to attach parts to the bed better is on the first layer, you can do a skirt offset close to zero, like uh, you know a fraction of a millimeter. And when you look at that, it'll actually be attached to the bottom of the part. So, Parts that uh, have a really thin connectivity with the, the bed, you can add a skirt like this. It'll um, cause them to adhere better. And then the other setting that is much less frequently used is a raft. Um, and that is if you have an uneven bed surface, I, I really don't recommend rafts. Again, they only show up in the preview mode, but um, it'll generate a raft like this that uh, can help you adhere your part to the bed uh, if your bed is, is not level and you don't have a better way of, of creating that level surface. Again, I don't highly recommend it, but it is a feature which is available and is sometimes, rarely, sometimes useful. Let's talk about fill and infill for a minute. Um, Fill is solid fill and infill is sparse fill. Those are the, the notations that we use. This is a infill type and the fraction is a percentage of, of infill roughly and then the start angle applies to solid fills. So let's just slice this and take a look at what we get. There are some hotkeys that are useful for this. Tilde through zero allows you to zoom up and down through your part. So that in addition to the scroll mouse wheel are useful for examining things like this. This is a hex infill and we can control the density by messing with this over here, reslicing it, and then you'll see that's obviously more sparse. So let us just play with 0.5 for a minute. Uh, we'll put this on, uh, say, grid type fill. There are a couple others you might be interested in that are interesting. For the purposes of this, I'm going to stick with hex for right now. It's the strongest uh, and lightest infill that I'm aware of. And let's talk about this overlap number here. It's I find this is easier to look at if you switch to the flat view. So let's slice it, go down to this, and then take a look at uh, V for single layer view. Here we'll see that these, these infills are overlapping each other and that sort of controls how well they bond. So at this interface here, if we change it something sort of ridiculous like um, 0.85 for example, and then just like slice it, go back to that layer and view it, you'll see that these are completely overlapping. This is actually a, a very bad way to print. These are, are, are not going to print well. So you usually want your overlap to be something around 30%. Uh, I find that 0.3 to 0.4 usually works the best. But that is worth experimenting with your printer and your filament and other types of settings. But that is what that setting does, does for you.
The last setting worth discussing under infill is that of start angle, which affects the angle of solid infill. If we look at the topmost layer, let's slice this, and hit V, we'll see that the angle of the fill is 45 degrees, and each subsequent layer rotates by 180 degrees. This sometimes, for odd situations like this, will create a problem, and the best way to address that is to go in and change the angle slightly, say 30 degrees. Let's slice it and then look at that again, and you'll see that it's altered the way that infill fills that space. Again, alternating by 180 degrees, but the starting angle is 30 degrees instead of 45 degrees, and that closes out infill settings. Now let's talk about support, and to do that, I'm going to go back to the path layout. So in support, there are a few things worth noting. Um, in the past, this was entirely heuristic, and now it's entirely manual. The first thing to do is just go in and click Detect and see where it detects the areas are needed for support. And you'll notice that these, are, these columns are highlighted in blue here. You can edit these by going in and clicking Plus, and then removing them, adding your own, and uh, either by clicking at the bottom like this or by adding them up above. So the settings that are that are worth noting uh, that you see here are the pillar size. If you click on like 10, for example, then you're going to create these really big pillars like that. And the part offset uh, controls how this uh, part, when sliced, is constrained to the boundaries of this part. So we'll see that there's this sort of slight gap in here. That is the part offset. If we change that to something a little bit uh, greater, like one, you'll see that, that that moves further away from the part. And this rail really controls layer or, or part bonding or, or pillar bonding. You're going to want to have that as close to the part as possible, but not less than, say, half a millimeter, because then you'll have a hard time getting it off. The gap layers is the number of layers between the end of the support and the part itself. And a gap layer of one is, is very, very typical. You're not usually going to want to have it be much more than that unless you're using very, very thin layers. So one is something you probably don't want to mess with. Minimum area is a culling factor. If it generates a, a very tiny support column, you can put in you know cubic millimeters here. It'll uh, automatically be sort of culled and removed. And one that's sort of hard to understand is this thing called expand, and that allows you to expand supports beyond the boundaries of a part so that it's not clipped to the part. It's something that you'll have to play with. The other setting that's useful is extruder, um, where you might want to have your support material be a different material. And in multi-extruder settings where your machine has multiple extruders, it's something that you, you have the option of uh, choosing separately. And um, the uh, max angle here is the detect angle for which a support will be automatically added. So let's remove all the, the supports here for a second. This is basically a 45 degree angle right here, and anything over you know 45 degrees, in this case 50, if you click detect, it's going to you know add a support column for that. If I were to make this something really slight, like 20, it's going to put them freaking everywhere. You don't really want to do that, um, but it's worth noting what that is for. So 50 is a good sort of default. Most 3D printers can print up to about 50 or sometimes 60 degrees, um, but they're always going to detect these overhangs because those are basically 90 degree overhangs. Uh, last setting worth talking about is the density function here. If we have a pillar, slice it, take a look at a cross section of that, you'll see that this is about a 50% infill. And if you want your infill to be more sparse on your supports, you can change it thusly. Go back and look at the cross section. Obviously, it's not as, as, as infilled. So that is what that setting does. And that's it for uh, supports. The output menu controls things that you can't really see on screen. They're worth experimenting for your print, and we'll go over them here. The default nozzle and bed temperature are here. You can override them in the base layer, the first layer. Otherwise, they apply to the entire print. The print speed is going to be your default uh, extrusion speed, except for the uh, finish speed, which is the outermost shell, which is the one that is visible to you, and the move speed, which is the, the non-printing speed. Shell factor, solid factor, and infill factor are extrusion multipliers for the shells, the infill, solid infill, and then the sparse infill. 
and then uh, whether or not you want the fan to come on, which layer that's going to come on. And then, of course, um, for uh, interlayer shell ordering, um, do you want to print your layers uh, inside out or outside in? And typically, inside out is going to give you the best look, but there are some cases where you want outside in. And then, of course, the layer start point is, you know, does the next layer start where the last layer left off? Uh, or does it try to start as close as possible to the center of the part or the origin? And again, this just really controls seam lines. And that's all the output menu does for you. The expert menu, uh, again, has very little to do with things you can see in your slicing, and they're, they're worth understanding and playing with. Um, for things like retraction, if you have oozing, uh, you're going to want to mess with this. How long the uh, nozzle will sort of hang around after a re-engagement, after a retraction, does the engagement dwell? Uh, these are usually things that you're going to want to spend a lot of time with Bowden systems, uh, a little less so with direct extruders. Min solid basically allows you to uh, exclude polygons that are smaller than a certain amount, and that's really just sort of a performance feature. There are a few cases when you want this to be anything other than zero or one. The minimum speed um, basically means that it will never generate uh, or do a slowdown lower than a, this certain speed here. Um, there are some cases where on shells you might want to have a non-printing area at the end of a shell. And uh, again, this is a rarely used feature. But the slow polygon is probably a more frequently used feature. And let's just take a look at that. I'm going to set it to zero right now, which disables the feature. And then let's go into preview here. And you'll see that uh, I left raft on. Um, but also uh, that the part all prints at the same speed. So let me uh, disable the raft here. And then I'm going to go into this and set a slow polygon of like 100 millimeters. And then let's go in and do a preview again. And you'll notice that this part of the print has been slowed down substantially. And uh, that's what the slow poly setting does here, is that polygons under a certain amount are going to be ramped down to the minimum speed. And that allows you to basically have better temperature control for layers that you don't want to print super fast if they're really, really small. Lastly, um, Z-hop distance is whenever you're moving between parts of a print and you don't want the nozzle to drag, it'll lift the nozzle a certain amount to prevent the drag marks from, from appearing. And anti-backlash is uh, a way of compensating for backlash in X or Y uh, by making additional movements it's subtle, it, it works um, best whether you have big flat parts uh, where you want shiny surfaces, but you'll almost uh, otherwise never notice it. Uh, pause layers is, uh, allows you to inject a list of layers that it will pause after inject a pause command um, if you want to do things like inset pieces like nuts into your part. Again, this is pretty advanced. And then layer retract is something that will retract the filament between layers. Again, very seldom used. Most printers, this isn't a problem. Um, and so you can probably safely ignore that unless you're really sort of you know, pulling your hair out trying to figure out something about uh, blobs between layers. This is an overview of the CAM CNC milling mode in Kirimoto. I'm going to assume a basic understanding of milling and show you Kirimoto's approach to this. First, ensure you're in the CNC mode find a device that is suitable for you either by scrolling through the list or by typing in a name and then clicking on one. And if you wish to change any of the fields, you will have to then customize the device and make it yours. Once you've done that, you can go in and begin to play with milling operations. The layout of the page here on the right hand side, these are modifiers. These modifiers affect all of the operations which are at the bottom. Things like cutout tabs, the size and shape of your stock, which can be enabled and disabled. Uh, limits on how deep you can cut, how high the tool passes over the stock when you're cutting. Things like that are all controlled over here. To get right into it, I will discuss basic types of operations and then the modifiers as they apply to each of the operations. The first milling operation we're going to look at is the level operator, and this is for creating a level work surface on your stock or from your part. It's relatively simple. You just select a tool and a step over, and if you click Start or S to generate, you'll see the tool paths generated here. 
go back and modify the step over like such, and you'll see the differences. If you don't have stock set, then it will be constrained to the boundaries of the part. Now we're going to look at the roughing operator, which is one of the workhorse operators that you'll use very frequently to remove large amounts of material. Um, it will have a step down and a step over, which is how far down and how far over to cut with each pass. One thing you'll notice right away with these defaults is that it's removing a large amount of material, but it's leaving these faces um, not really directly cut. And so the way to address that is to enable clear faces. Let's re-slice that. You'll see it injects additional layers where it's cutting down. That's good for a small number of um, horizontal faces, but it may not be great for a part that has a lot of um, horizontal faces. So we'll discuss later how to address that, but that's what clear faces does. The other thing that you'll notice is that it's not clearing the top of the part here. And that's true even if you've moved the uh, part down into the stock. So the option for that is clear top, and that will uh, create a, a clearing pass across the top of the part. And if you move the part all the way to the bottom, and it's in this case, you'll see that it adds more than one clearing pass so that each step down stays within the bounds of the step down that was specified for that part. The last option that's sort of interesting is the inside only option, which will restrict cutting passes to the interior of the part boundary. It will not create these outside cutouts, which when they go all the way down could cause the part to, to come loose. And um, that's what tabs are for, but it's a discussion for another section. Those are the main operations for, for roughing with the uh, exception of clear voids. And what clear voids does is for interior spaces like this, for voids that clear all the way down to the bottom of a part, typically, if that was a very large void, you might not want to spend all the time milling it out. And so you would uncheck clear voids and it will leave that part untouched and would just cut it out. And so an efficiency thing for voids that are very, very large that pass all the way through a part. But those are the major options for roughing. The outline operator sometimes can be used independently or as a cleanup operation after roughing if you've left some material. By itself, um, uh, if you leave the default option set, it acts as a cleanup pass for roughing. So let's take a look at that. Here you'll see it clearing down the faces, the edge of the faces, all the way down to the bottom. This is the cleanup mode, and it's good for 2D cutouts as well if you're just doing simple 2D cutouts. The next thing to look at is inside only, which similar to the roughing operation will only cut inside of the part boundaries. It's a little bit more restrictive and uh, less seldom um, used than any other setting. And also when you click it, it hides the features that are not relevant to that. Um, the outside only setting is actually quite different because it moves into what's called a shadow mode. And here it projects a shadow up from the bottom of the part, bottom to the top, and this is good for doing uh, 2D cutouts or other restrictive type of cutting where you don't actually want to clear faces, you just want to cut the part out of the stock. And another option available in outside only is called wide cutout. And what wide cutout is for is if you have a hard material that's deep and the milling operation might cause chatter. And this basically widens the cutout path to allow that to uh, occur more smoothly. And then the last operation, which is, uh, this is not a good um, material to show this in, or an object to show this in, is dog bones. And that's when you're doing um, press fit pieces that need to have a dog bone cut into it. And that is uh, the subject of an entirely different video for later on. The contour operator is another workhorse operator that is uh, very useful for parts that are complicated, uh, where you want to have uh, complex geometries cut out, smooth surfaces, things like lettering. So let's take a look at sort of a default contour X pass, which is uh, passing along the X axis here. You'll notice that the, um, the curves are running up and over and there's this curved fashion, and that takes into account the geometry of the in mill selected. So if we go back and change this ball mill to an end mill, which has a, has a square bottom instead of a rounded bottom, and redo this, you'll notice that these edges are now square cuts because the end mill doesn't have a radius face. And 
The other thing to notice here is this is on the x-axis. If we add a, another contouring operation, then it notices the first one's x and by default take, changes the next one to a y. And then if we run both of these, we'll see that there is clearing in both directions like this. The other thing you can do with the contour operator is tell it to do curves only. And curves only means it won't cut flat faces. It will restrict cutting operations to faces which are not flat. And in this case, that's useful because I don't want to spend a lot of time milling out the rest of the part if I've uh, cleared that with a roughing operator. And the other operator that you can apply here is the inside only operation, which is similar to outline and roughing, which constrains the cuts to the part boundaries. Let's look at the drilling operation before moving on to tracing. Drilling is quite simple. It just matches an end mill to uh, any hole in the part that is the same diameter as that end mill. So let's take a look at this really quickly. Eighth inch end mill is matching these eighth inch holes right here. If we go through and animate this, then let's take a look at what happens here. You'll notice it takes a series of step downs and then step back up. And in drilling, you don't usually do that as a single operation. You let the, the bit come back up to clear material. Um, and then you can, of course, control how long it hangs out at the bottom before it pulls back up. These are just different ways to, to optimize the drilling based on your material. We can add a second drilling operation that uses another end mill and clear out the second hole. And if we animate that, you'll notice that there is also a, a tool change in between the drilling operations. After it finishes one, it'll generate a tool change operator. And if your part or if your uh, controller will honor that, then you'll be able to change end mills uh, midway through. Let's look at the tracing operation. It uh, really re deserves its own video because it's relatively complicated and, and interesting. Doesn't look like it, but in this case we have a part, let's assume we've done a um, roughing operation on this and we want to um, get these radius areas finished really nicely. You can select a, a, a quarter inch ball mill, a follow operation, and then when you click plus, it analyzes the part and we can say, let's clear out these, or rather follow these with a ball end mill. And that's what the follow operator does. And if we go to animate this and run it, we'll see that it basically just does what it says. It follows that path with a given end mill. And that by itself is pretty powerful for certain types of operations. You can add another tracing operation um, that has an, uh, also does as a follow. Let's say we want to add a taper mill uh, across these two features right here. And so when we go and animate this, we'll see that it runs the two um, radius operations with the ball mill and it'll go back and do the chamfers with the taper mill. So that's pretty useful. And there's one other mode for tracing that is very powerful. Uh, maybe it's duplicative with roughing, but there are a lot of cases when you would want to do this by itself. And that operation is what's called clear. And clear will clear an area. Let's take a, an end mill, in this case, a, a pretty beefy one, and say, I want to clear this area right here. And if I just do that by itself, then it'll clear it irrespective of what you see inside. But if I go back and edit this and say exclude these areas right here, then it will go in and it will cut out and exclude those areas. So that's what the clear operator does and that's what the follow operator does. Um, individually powerful, together powerful, you can chain them together with a series of, of operations as post-processing or by themselves for things like lettering. So channels like this might be part of a lettering thing that you're working on, in which case you would come in and change this to a follow, change this to a taper mill, and then select the features that you want that to follow. And then we can animate that, and this is what it looks like. Pretty easy. The next two operators are for double-sided milling. The first is register. This drills registration marks so that you can flip apart and work on both sides. Um, you can have registration marks in the X or the Y axis, and you can choose it as two or three points. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We slice it, and here are our three registration marks. 
if you want those to uh, go all the way through the bottom of your stock, then you basically just click on limits and add a Z through, and that will then extend these cuts through the bottom of the stock. In addition to this, we will want to use what's called a flip operator, and the flip operator allows you to have a sequence of operations applied to each side of a part. So on, let's call this the A side, we're going to create some registration marks, and then we go in and add a roughing operation, and we can drag that to where we want it. And here are our two operations for the A side. Now we've generated the G code for that, and you go to and flip the part. The part will then flip over, and we can add some operations for the back side. So let's say we're doing a tracing operation on the back side of this that is going to be done with an in a, ball, a ball mill. We'll change that to a clear, and then we'll select the area that we want to do the operation on the B side, and it looks like this. So now we have a series of operations for the A and the B side, and at any time we can use the flip operator to flip between those two sides of the part and then work on them. And if you save this profile, the A and the B side will be saved together so that what you have down here, if you see a flip operator, you know that there's going to be another side you can flip and then work off of that side. Pretty powerful um, and also uh, pretty simple in terms of the way it's presented. A good place to talk about the use of tabs in a part, especially for double-sided milling. Tabs allow you to retain a part inside of the stock uh, and prevent it from being cut out. Now in this case usually the tabs will align to the bottom of a part but in double-sided milling there are two things that we're going to want to do. And the first is we're going to want to limit the Z bottom to roughly half the height of the part. So if we go through and slice this we'll see that it's going to constrain the cut down to about halfway through the part and when we do that if we go back and add tabs you'll see that the tabs now are aligned with the bottom of the cutout area. One other thing you can do with tabs is you can say, I want it to be a midline. And that basically, if we just click on a couple of tabs here and slice, you'll see that the cut goes to the middle of the tab. The other nice thing about the tabs uh, with a flip operator is that when you flip apart, the tabs are going to follow the, the part across the other side, which is obviously what you're going to want when you um, are having tabs when you flip the part. If you're not cutting out the tabs in the same spot, then you're going to have trouble. So these things, uh, have to follow the part on a flip like that. So uh, tabs are areas that are not going to be cut out when the milling occurs and that allows them to be retained in the part um, so that you can mill out everything else except for those tabs and then when you're done you just snip the tabs and you uh, can extract the part from the stock. This is an overview of the laser 2D cutout mode in Kirimoto. It is geared entirely toward 2D cutout operations and also includes a mode for drag knives since that is typically a 2D type cutout operation very similar to laser. What's most important to note is the offset value here which is usually the kerf or the width of the laser. So if I just go do a basic slicing operation and look at the outlines that are generated, I will use the V key to restrict it to a single layer and you will see the layer line here is the outside of the part and then the cut line here is the offset line which accommodates the width of the cutting tool which in this case is the laser. The setting that's important to note here is depending upon the type of laser cutout that you want to do and in this case if I have height set to zero what it will do is it will look at all of the different layers in a part and it will create a midline cut through those layers. So you'll see there's a change here, a change here and here, and if we slice that we'll see a line cut through each of those layers. And that is the default mode if you want to, for example, combine different layers into a colored PDF or SVG for something like a Glowforge. And what you would do in that case is you would go to Output, and you would, I'm sorry, you would go to layout, you would say merged, and in a preview, it will then collapse those down into a single PDF or SVG where the colors are combined wherever layers intersect. If you do not have that checked and you do a slice operation, when you go to preview, it will then tile them as separate grouped pieces. 
The other option is to set a specific height for slicing and here you'll get a slice every millimeter and the same thing applies. You can either merge them or you can not have them merged, in which case it will produce a tile at every uh, millimeter of height or whatever the height you've specified under the layers. The other option is to have a single cut at a single height. So in this case, I could say I want to cut at two millimeters, or I could say I want to cut at three millimeters or four millimeters, and then it just does a single slice, and that's a very simple operation without any more complicated stuff going on. The other operations that you have control over are things called like layer coloring, and let me bring in a different model to show you what that might look like. Taking sort of the default cube we have here, if we slice that, we'll get an output like this. If we go to preview, we'll get the parts like this. And if you do a layer colored operation, you'll see that it colors each layer individually and progressively from the top right down to the bottom left. So we know this is the top of the part going down through the middle of the part here, down to the bottom here. And that's useful if you want to apply different cutting operations to different layers in the output. And the other output options are whether or not you want the XY coordinate system to be based on the center of the part, the, the bounds of the part, and things like that. And those are things that you can play with depending upon your needs. And then the last thing that you can do is this um, knife cutout, um, sorry, the drag knife layout option, which produces uh, radiuses for drag knives. And I'm going to use a different uh, model for that again. So if I do a simple cutout here and look at the layout, we'll see that you've got these overcut radii, which are generated based on the settings for the tip offset. So the smaller that number is, the less you're going to get a radius uh, output here for your drag knife. This is an overview of the SLA 3D printing mode in Kirimoto. You will notice that only the Anycubic Photon is supported. It's the printer that I have, and it's the only one I have documentation for in terms of the file format. Uh, which is almost defensively stupid in my opinion because they're just a series of images with lamp on and off times. I'm not sure what the companies think they're protecting. If you have access to other documentation, I would love to have it and integrate them into Kirimoto. So this is pretty simple. You've got a slice height. This is the most simple uh, operation you can have. It slices this into a series of layers, a lot of them because it's SLA, in this case 375. But this is just a solid model. If you want to get fancier with this, let's try hollowing this out, for example. And so if we slice it now, we'll see that as we move down through the part, that it is in fact hollow inside. And that's interesting, but there's also no way for the resin to escape. So one thing you can do in this mode is say open top. And when you slice that, the top will be open and the resin can drain out. You can in fact open the bottom as well Reslice it and see that it is a pass through part. So that's kind of cool. Um, but there are some other things you can play with as well. If you go to infill and set an infill density, for example, it will create this uh, layered grid. And those grid lines are controlled by the line width here. So you can make those thicker or thinner, and you can create uh, the density higher or lower. If we go back zooming down through this, you can see how the pattern is implemented and that provides plenty of or ample ways for the, for the resin to drain out and to create a lightweight part. Something else worth noting is that uh, you, for each layer, you have the light on and off time, peel distances and rates and all that kind of stuff that uh, allows you to tune in for your resin and lamp. There is a special setting for the base of the part, which is the stuff that touches the build plate. You have a number of layers with a special on and off time for the lamp and the peel uh, rate and distance for those layers. And then, of course, the last thing that you're going to want to do is uh, potentially have a support structure. And if you turn on a support structure, that has a way of auto-generating supports and it generates a base. So if we re-slice this with this turned on, you'll see that it generates a base for the part uh, that attaches to the plate. This isn't as sophisticated as the FDM mode, and it will get better over time, especially as I have the opportunity to add 
more device supports to this, um, then it'll become worth it. So I do hope you're able to provide references and pointers to file formats that I can implement here. And lastly, on the output, there is, uh, you know, modular your printer support for it, the support for anti-aliasing the output function, uh, as well as a Z offset on the first layer, which may or may not be useful to preventing an elephant foot based on how you've calibrated your printer. But those are pretty much the uh, all the settings for SLA. Um, it seems like a lot, but it's really just that there are a lot of duplication around the light on and off and the peel distance and things like that. It's otherwise pretty simple to use. And once you've done previewing it, um, here, the most expensive part computationally is the export function, which has to generate all of the images and uh, as a result can sometimes take longer than you would expect. But once you do the export, you can go and look at the preview of what the layers are actually going to look like coming out and then you can download the file when you're done. Pretty simple. The last remaining point of order is support and bug reporting. In Kiribato 2.5, you can right-click on the workspace and export it. This will produce a .km file that anyone can bring into Kiribato to replicate your workspace exactly. This is perfect for replicating bugs and uh, reporting them. You can also uh, go under the profile menu and export a profile with or without the workspace. And this is a good way of saving all your settings and devices that you can either import into another browser on another machine or share with somebody else. And also um, you can go to the forums or Discord for help and look forward to seeing you guys there. That is the best way to find a community of like-minded people who may be able to help you with your issues or to report feedback to help make Kirimoto better. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. Kirimoto is a passion project going on seven years, and it's the contributions and engagement of the community that drives its growth. So I hope to see you on the forums or in Discord with your feedback and bug reports.